Hello, and welcome to Bloomberg New Economy Catalyst. This program will celebrate breakthroughs, like the vaccines that are speeding up the global recovery from COVID-19. It will shine a spotlight on innovators who are at the cutting edge of their fields. And it will help our global audience reimagine what's possible in science, technology, public policy, and more. Over the next two hours, you'll meet pioneers in e-commerce and space who are conquering new frontiers and helping to transform lives around the world. Congratulations to all the 2021 Bloomberg New Economy Catalysts, and I look forward to seeing you at the Forum in Singapore this November. Singapore. Has Linda Armin, your host for part three of the inaugural Bloomberg New Economy Catalyst event. Over the course of our six hour program, we're introducing you to a group of dynamic, visionary entrepreneurs, scientists, and policymakers from all over the world. They're catalysts. They inspire new ideas, fresh thinking, and novel approaches to all quandaries. But most importantly, they incite action. At Bloomberg The Economy, we take a cautiously optimistic view of the future of humanity, informed by a wave of entrepreneurs here accelerated by the pandemic. COVID-19 has caused millions of lives and destroyed countless small businesses around the world. But out of this catastrophe, a new economy is being born. Now, the new economy puts the planet first. It prioritizes food security and access to healthcare and finance. It considers equity to be paramount. And all of these impulses are driven by revolutionary advances in technologies like AI, gene editing, and robotics. Our event has shown how our catalysts are tackling the world's most pressing issues in the areas of climate, agriculture, biotech, and digital money. In this final session, we will focus on the warp speed acceleration of e-commerce, as well as space where we're pushing the frontiers toward ever more distant planets. It's so exciting. Now, to kick off our e-commerce focus program, the 21st century consumer, we ask people from all over the world if they trust tech giants that have exploded in growth during the pandemic to control the consumer economies of the future. Take a listen to what we had. We have a monopoly controlling 50 cents on the e-commerce dollar that is actually raising prices for the consumer. So what do we need? What do we need? We need to return to our proud legacy of antitrust and break up companies when they become invasive species. We need to trust government again. No, we can't trust Amazon. My uh, firm belief is that it is indeed possible for us to ensure that the right balance is maintained such that this data doesn't become, um, uh, doesn't get carried away by the big tech to, uh, to their advantages. So I am positive, I am an optimist. I think that we should probably facilitate international as well as intranational cooperation to strengthen labor laws, to discourage corruption, so that these large online platforms can't get away with facilitating a race to the bottom. I firmly believe that large tech giants will play a very important role in providing the necessary e-commerce infrastructure for the world uh, in the next 10 years, which hopefully should cause a huge surge uh, in e-commerce penetration. I think, you know, if you get your shopping uh, two hours after you buy it uh, online, it would be very difficult to go back to how you used to be previously. And I think that's the key thing that I find really, really exciting about e-commerce in that uh, the pandemic has been an accelerator, but uh, the changes that we've seen are here to stay. Some thought-provoking comments there. Thanks to all who took the time to respond. Now, before we introduce you to our catalyst, we should explain that each segment of our program is divided into three parts, where we seek to answer the questions, what matters, what's next, and what if. Join us 
on our journey with our catalyst as we discuss the challenges, dive into the solutions and dream big about what's possible over the horizon. You will have the opportunity to participate and we want you to do that. Participate in the conversation through the chat box and polls on the right side of the screen if you're joining us on the platform or through social media using the hashtag Bloomberg Catalyst. That's Bloomberg Catalyst. Now, before we get to our first panel, I want to ask you, our audience, a question. You ready? Now, what's the greatest opportunity for e-commerce? Is it lowering price and speeding delivery? Is it bringing visibility to supply chains to force them to become more sustainable? Or is it opening new markets for small and medium-sized enterprises? And option four, E-commerce creates new problems around monopolies and abuse of personal data. So what do you think? If you're registered on our platform, do mark your answer to that question in the box on the right side of your screen. And I'll read out the results in just a few minutes. In the meantime, I want to introduce our first What Matters segment. E-commerce often gets a bad rap. Critics focus on its tendency to produce monopolies and worry about what tech giants are really doing with all of our personal data now. Don't forget, though, this industry took off during COVID and responded to need. Urban residents in lockdown were desperate for home deliveries. Necessity also played a huge part. Millions of unemployed workers found jobs in e-commerce startups. At a time of social distancing, digital businesses replaced high-touch with low-touch services. Most importantly as well, digital commerce offers more transparency in supply chains, giving the consumers, you, the chance to be sure their money goes towards sustainable businesses that treat their work as well. It's a lifeline for small and medium-sized enterprises all over the world. Online stories are replacing smaller brick and mortar shops. Now, one entrepreneur knows this, Ankiti Bose, CEO and co-founder of Singapore-based Zilingo ties all of those trends together. She has set out to digitize the Asian fashion supply chain, which provides the world's retail giants with its denim, sneakers, and crop tops, something I don't wear anymore, by the way. Now, I want to welcome her now and start by asking, Ankiti, how did COVID change your world? And by the way, welcome. Thank you, Haslinda. I think, uh, you know, COVID has been the single most important event uh, when it comes to digitization of our entire industry. Fashion and textile manufacturing, as you would know, has historically been one of the biggest culprits of, uh, you know, polluting the world, especially as it gets faster and faster. So what has happened in the last few years is that e-commerce has made it such that consumers want everything immediately. Consumers want it fast. Uh, it's not two seasons or four seasons a year. It's 12 seasons or more. Uh, and uh, what that's done is that uh, there has been an exponential growth in fast fashion. But um, you know, on, on, on the flip side, 70% of the world's landfills are filled with non-biodegradable uh, fabrics and, and related materials. One t-shirt takes about 2,700 liters of water to, uh, you know, manufacture. This is, uh, you know, you're talking about a supply chain that has 60% uh, of the workers tend to be uh, women uh, in the garment manufacturing industries in countries like Bangladesh and Vietnam and Indonesia and so on. Uh, so so uh, what, what COVID did was that that as it forced the digitization of the entire supply chain because things were required to be shipped so quickly and all online, it also forced transparency across the entire uh, you know, chain, which has been incredibly valuable in terms of providing data to companies to actually do things correctly and transparently, something that wasn't happening before. You know, you brought up a lot of issues, including transparency, ESG, labor issues. I mean, we talk about how a digital strategy can help boost profit. How do you then tap that increased profitability to drive ESG goals in the business? Uh, that's a very, very important uh, point and a very important question, Haslinda. Uh, as uh, we digitize any archaic industry, the first thing that happens is that middlemen fall away 
and more efficiencies come in. Uh, now, in the fashion industry, what that means is there is a 5 to 10% improvement in profitability as brands source digitally rather than the way they were doing conventionally before. Now, that additional margin or that additional profitability uh, comes with two things. One is naturally a lot of traceability in terms of where the product came from because you're not dealing with uh, agents and middlemen anymore. Uh, so, so, so brands and businesses and even very small businesses can now verify whether there was complete compliance in terms of uh, where the product was made, who made it, and whether all rules and regulations were followed in that process. So that's one. Uh, the second thing is uh, just that the additional um, uh, profitability that is getting unlocked can then be reinvested in making sure that you know the manufacturing processes are carbon neutral or that better fabrics are used now i'm not i'm not uh, uh, you know uh, saying that right now it's a priority for all businesses but i think in general as uh, businesses wake up to the fact that consumers do want something which is more conscious and more sustainable especially since uh, they are consuming so much of it uh, it becomes extremely important uh, to know that the cost of esg is is not uh, you know going to hurt your bottom line as a business as a small business or as a large business and that profitability can be uh, the driving force behind the adoption of more sustainable practices which is i think a tremendous uh, tremendous idea and different from what we've thought historically where we've thought that solving for climate change or solving for esg is great in the long term but it's expensive in the short term but that does not have to be the way any longer it's great that people are talking about ESG sustainability. The thing is, you have to walk the talk. I mean, what do you do about accountability? How do you ensure that companies use suppliers that treat work as well, that, su that support sustainable supply chains? So, uh, Hassan, that's exactly right. Uh, what we do, and we work with thousands of uh, SMEs that source with us, as well as larger brands. Uh, what we do is we have a matrix of third party compliance checks, as well as sustainability uh, metrics, as well as, uh, you know, compliance packages country by country so that every brand knows that uh, they have uh, the, the right means and the right checkpoints that actually validate whether their manufacturing process, whether you know the people that are in the factories are exactly uh, what who they think uh, they are. Now, that is only possible when companies like us have software actually validating that data inside the factories. Uh, that's today in 2021. As we as we look to the next 18 to 24 months, we actually think that the role of uh, RFID tags in each of the uh, uh, factories, the role of blockchain in validating this data actually takes this even further. Again, like I want to emphasize that none of this comes at a cost uh, to the uh, businesses that are working with us. It's not more expensive to do this any longer because the additional profitability can be invested back in these checks and balances, which uh, you know we provide and companies like us provide, um, just ensuring fully that the first step of ESG, which is regulatory compliance, is met. Beyond that, uh, you know, a, a platform like ours, uh, what we do is that we make an a la carte uh, selection. So uh, you know, the first step is making sure that all regulatory compliance is met. The second is perhaps on, you know, a brand says, I want to make sure that all my manufacturing processes are carbon neutral. Maybe the third one is that I only want to use sustainable fabrics with the right, uh, you know, checks and balances in place just to make sure that, uh, you know, landfills are not getting filled up with non-biodegradable materials and so on. Uh, we understand that it's not a binary switch. You can't just force businesses today to be completely ESG compliant. So it's baby steps, uh, one by one, that takes us there in the future. Uh, but it's already significantly better than, say, it was five years ago. Qu qu quantify that for us. How much traction are you seeing? I mean, if you take a look at the fashion industry in Asia in particular, it is one of the biggest culprits. I mean, one of the biggest Absolutely. offenders when it comes to labor issues, for instance. How much traction? I mean, how are you reaching out? How are you convincing those who work with you? 
So, uh, absolutely, Hislinda. So, uh, there are about 5,000 factories in ASEAN and South Asia uh, that uh, engage in manufacturing for what we would broadly call fast fashion. And, uh, you know, what we are discussing now is that fast fashion doesn't have to be all bad. Uh, as of today, about 10% of those factories uh, are engaged in uh, supplying to digital channels such as us and, uh, you know, are open to uh, validating their entire process. Processes. Now, now that's uh, that's that's great because in most industries, uh, uh, the the penetration of sustainable or, or ESG compliance is, is you know less than three percent. Uh, so so it's already great that ASEAN and uh, South Asia are moving the right direction. Uh, even you know when compared to China and other manufacturing hubs in the world, uh, there's a far greater degree of transparency that's already available amongst the the let's say the fast fashion manufacturers in the this region. Uh, the next step for us would be to encourage, uh, you know, these businesses that are already uh, using us and, uh, you know, other digital platforms to then uh, adopt the use of carbon neutral processes, um, you know, processes that help and conserve resources like water and uh, making sure that the products or the, the fabrics, etc., that are being used are also sustainable, uh, wherein it's probably, you know, today the industry is at less than 5% penetration. Again, just for the benefit of everybody, five to ten percent of uh, manufacturers in our industry already using digital or adopting digital methods has only happened because of the pandemic. But it's great because you know a lot of other sectors are are, are not this far ahead. Of course, fashion has been a big culprit historically, so there's a there's a, there's a lot to make up for. Ankiti, I just want to reveal the results of our poll. The question was, what's the greatest opportunity for e-commerce? We have 16% voting, voting for lowering prices and speeding delivery. 16% bringing visibility to supply chains to force them to become more sustainable. 42% opening new markets for small and medium-sized enterprises. 26% actually E-commerce creates new problems around monopolies and abuse of personal data. So 42% voting for opening new markets for small and medium-sized enterprises. Ankiti, I want to pose this question to you. What's, yeah. your own, what's your own choice? What's the greatest opportunity for e-commerce? I, I really agree with the audience here. Uh, I think uh, the real opportunity is in unlocking potential for SMEs and new businesses, uh, especially as we see that a string of new businesses are online first or what we call digitally native. And uh, and, and being digitally native makes uh, it such that it's not just the way that they sell to consumers that is digital. It's the way that they source, the way that they manufacture, the way that they finance their business, which is digital, more transparent, and thus much, much more uh, reliable as well as, uh, uh, you know, I would say uh, conscious in the way that business is conducted just because there is so much transparency. So I completely agree with the audience uh, and I'm sure everybody in our startup does as well uh, that that is perhaps the largest opportunity that we're about to unlock. Uh, earlier, Ankiti, you talked about how there is a checklist when it comes to ESG, transparency and so on and so forth. Give us a sense of what standards are being used. Are they in line with global standards and how uh, and will they be tweaked as we move forward? Uh, absolutely. So, uh, Hasinda, today, what's happening on our platform and on, uh, on uh, you know, most digital platforms is that every country has, uh, you know, the the, stand, the base is making sure that the manufacturing standards are reliable in terms of labor, in terms of who's making the product, and whether all regulatory checks are being, uh, you know, performed at the 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 shop floor of a factory where the product is being made. Uh, so the standards used by Zilingo and uh, are are obviously global standards, but they vary from country to mm. country because. Is every every you know we are, we are in eight man, uh, manufacturing hubs. Every country provides its own regulatory uh, compliance checks. Um, now that's the that's the bare minimum. That is the, the the requirement. So that's the first point in the checklist that everybody absolutely must comply with. Not just the lingo, uh, you know, uh, factories, but basically anybody in the world making anything must comply with that. And then the next step is uh, you know to comply with fabric checks, right? So it, it, what kind of fabric is it? Is it uh, is it tensile? How is it made? 
made? Is it biodegradable? Meaning that when the product mm. does go through its entire life cycle, is it going to be polluting or not? And then the third one is to work with, again, international agencies. And uh, we work with about six of them that uh, go at the level of, again, might vary from country to supply hub to actually check on the processes uh, that make uh, the manufacturing, uh, you know, be uh, either carbon neutral or consume the right amount of water or, you know, just recycle the products that would typically go to waste. So I would say these are the three steps in the checklist. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I would just encourage every business to think of the regulatory checks as the first point, which absolutely needs to be met. The thing is, it's a huge problem and it involves a lot of manufacturers. We have about 170 million uh, child laborers in, in the textile industry alone. Have you, have you experienced any pushback? I mean, what are you seeing in terms of the feedback from manufacturers and perhaps even governments? Uh, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, uh, this is, uh, again, fashion, textile, home. These are supply chains that have uh, historically had, uh, you know, a lot of controversy. Uh, in fact, we, we don't do a lot of work in China, but, you know, in, in fact, the Xinjiang cotton uh, crisis that recently became a, a, a huge problem was, again, the same supply chain. We've had uh, fast fashion brands, uh, you know, global large fast fashion brands be criticized at scale because uh, they were not uh, checking, uh, you know, uh, whether there were little children in factories and so on and so forth. So I think uh, historically it's been it, it's been a big issue. Uh, what the pandemic has done it, by removing agents is that uh, basically the opacity behind which these practices were hiding uh, went away. Now, when that opacity goes away, the agents go away and uh, the brands and the consumers can t see to a much greater degree uh, uh, or, or have that traceability to a much greater degree, there is there is nowhere to hide. Uh, and whether it is pushback from you know local unions right. in a lot of these countries and so on, it's actually incredibly hard when you digitize the entire chain. So uh, the, the reason that historically some of these practices existed is only because you know businesses wanted uh, more profitability. So what we uh, you know deeply believe is that by freeing up those margins, you're giving people an incentive to do the right thing without it being more expensive. And that's mm. perhaps the most effective way of doing it. You know, uh, the the carrot, uh, and not necessarily uh, just the stick uh, in in the supply chain. And nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. Ankiti Boats, all this a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. And congratulations you, on being named a 2021 New Economy Catalyst. Now, it's an economic truth universally accepted that the fastest way to grow an emerging economy is by empowering women. Bangladesh is a shining example. Its economy is a standout in South Asia, in large part driven by women-owned businesses. But... Women need opportunities to thrive. A catalyst, Vidya Trey, co-founder and CEO of social commerce platform Misho, is offering that very chance across India. Bloomberg Quick Take anchor Jennifer Zabasaja spoke to Vidit about inclusion through e-commerce. So Vidit, thanks so much for being here. First of all, talk to us about Misho. I mean, it was created in 2015. What was the problem that you were trying to address with this company? Yeah, thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to kind of share our story here. Um, so Misho, let me first start with a very quick introduction. So Misho is India's largest social commerce platform that has enabled more than 20 million women in India to start their own online shops on platforms such as WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, and so on. And let me give you like a quick overview of why we even like started this business six years ago. So back in 2015, what we saw was India is primarily a small business economy. So 90% of India's total retail is small business driven, long tail, unstructured, unbranded. But most of what has gone online in India is smartphones, white goods, branded fashion, and so on. Most of these are branded and organized category, right? So the real Indian retail economy is still primarily offline. So back in 2015, we said, how can we really take all of these small businesses in India, create a very simple platform for them so that they can come online and become successful. And that's when we started Misho, 
Mishu name comes from like Mary shop put together, which means my shop, because we wanted to give a shop of their own to each and every small business in India. Our vision is to enable 100 million small business in India to succeed online. So yeah, that's that's the quick story behind why we started Misho. Well, and talk about what happened in 2020. We saw a lot of e-commerce companies really pivot or, you know, have good business in 2020. I wonder how you were able to adjust and, and push forward some of the things that you were trying to work on prior to. Yeah, so internally, I, I say this quite often, that 2020 was the best as well as the toughest year for the company since we started. And the reason we saw like the bottom uh, of revenues of everything going bad to like things coming back really, really well. So when India went into lockdown, like a very strict lockdown, when all of e-commerce was banned for about a quarter, our revenue just went away. Like we could not sell anything at all. But when things started to come back, we saw lots and lots of people in large cities to the smallest villages were hesitating to go offline and buy products. And they wanted to find a very safe way of buying stuff online. And we saw like crazy amount of traffic coming to our platform, more and more people looking to start their shops to provide, like for example, for their family, put food on the table and so on. So we saw massive acceleration in our business over the last 12 months. Like in just in the last 12 months, number of customers on our platform have grown by 10x. It just become 10x in such a short span of time. Number of orders and transactions on the platform have also grown by about the same amount. Right? So an amazing year. And I think that tailwind that almost all e-commerce businesses are like getting across the world because more and more people are finding much more comfortable to buy on. But in our case, I think we saw like much stronger tailwinds in our business because we tend to focus a lot on smaller towns and cities in India. And there the penetration of e-commerce was almost negligible. So imagine that people went from almost never buying online to suddenly increasing their share of purchases online, a lot of that coming to a platform. So that's why we saw this massive surge. And um, yeah, I think it's been a great year for the entire company and generally for e-commerce as a sector. Why, what does e-commerce do for small and, and mid-sized economies? I mean, we see Amazon and other companies focusing on bigger economies. What is it that e-commerce provides for, you mentioned women, um, but also these smaller economies that you're focused on? Yeah, I think small businesses, especially in a country like India, um, before this could never go out beyond their community and grow their business. But what has happened, especially with e-commerce, we see these millions of small businesses suddenly have access to markets across the country. Like you could be in one small city in India and through e-commerce serve customers across the like nation like very, very quickly, right? And I think that is a very strong superpower for all small businesses. Another very, very important thing is, I think 20 years ago, before all of this e-commerce had come, the only way a, a business could do marketing was like through TV, through uh, like radio and so on. It was almost unaffordable for a typical small business. But what has happened with like online coming in and a lot of other platforms, it has become really, really easy for a lot of these small businesses to like spend small amounts, gain access to customers, grow their business and so on. So I think e-commerce in general has been much more empowering for these small micro nano kinds of businesses because now there's no barrier like it's not hey i have news of this much these millions of dollars every year you can't afford these like channels of growth and so on so i really believe that e-commerce in general has been a very very positive uh thing for all kinds of small businesses and like almost a superpower and how much of what Misho is doing is based on the community? Because I know you say it's a lot of community-driven opinion leaders um, that are fueling the business, yeah? Yeah, and I think that was our one of the biggest insights when we started the business. Like back in 2015, a lot of people used to say that, hey, these small businesses never move online. Most of what will keep going online is branded because a lot of people tried what we are doing, but no one succeeded. And we said, let us go offline and understand how small businesses operate. 
and we said most small businesses live start with the very local people in that community really trust them believe in their curation believe in like what people are curating on a daily basis across categories for them and we started to see this that a lot of these small businesses they had not gone and created websites online but all of them had created these whatsapp groups or facebook groups or instagram pages to invite people in their own community to follow them there get recommendations on products and buy from them so we said maybe the first version of small businesses online are going to be this community that exist on these social platforms so that's why the first version and that's what has scaled so fast is almost all of these 20 million women entrepreneurs are talked about run these whatsapp or facebook communities where they add all their friends people in their community neighbors and so on they start to curate products on a daily basis tell them what they really like and what they don't like and why it is they like, really a particular customer and so on and that just takes off i think people really like that personalized experience that a lot of these small businesses can give that large businesses can almost never give so given all of this new opportunity vidit what do you see as the next innovation coming down the line in in this space yes the mission statement of mission is to democratize internet commerce for everyone in india our vision statement is to enable 100 million small businesses in india to succeed online and i think the next 5 to 10 years for us are going to be just focused on this like how do we enable like like small businesses of not just one category where we started which is mostly fashion lifestyle but all kinds of categories out there be it grocery be it personal care be it beauty and like hundreds of other categories how do we enable all those kinds of small businesses and make them successful online that will require us to build very different kind of supply chains that would require us to build very different kind of customer experiences and that's the kind of technology we're working on second a lot of our focus is to kind of go out and make our product accessible to people who can't access our product today it is because of languages we still have all kinds of languages in india uh, a lot of selection that cannot afford uh, is not available on the platform in india so a lot of things that we are going to do is making a product more accessible for different customers again across the country india is a very very heterogeneous country like there's a saying that every 2 kilometers in india everything changes from language from food from culture right so you need to build a very very personalized experience so people really feel that this app really belongs to me and everyone has very very different kinds of taste so a lot of our work that we are doing in technology is to make like the product more accessible by personalizing uh using data science machine learning artificial intelligence and so on so these are it's some of the areas where as a company we're going to focus a lot of our bandwidth on and make sure we keep innovating and keep making sure that more and more small businesses find it much easier to succeed online and finally vidit um you are definitely seen as a pioneer in this space i i wonder who inspires you i mean who who uh who's doing something that you're just really inspired by and motivates you Yeah I think I don't know if there's a one single person who has inspired our journey but if you ask me who inspires us is is like all these women entrepreneurs that we see on a daily basis whose life we are like impacting in some way I think that gives the kind of pride to the entire organization not just to me that really fuels us every single day right and I think that was also a big motivator why we started working towards this and let me kind of share a story around this when we started 6 years ago we realized so in india the percentage of women who are part of the workforce that percentage even among developing countries is very very low like most of women in india are not part of the workforce and a lot of those reasons are cultural so we saw that these 85% of entire women population are at home but they have aspirations like they are very ambitious a lot of them want to do something of their own they don't want to have an identity only of the husband or the family and they are trying really hard like trying to gather some capital so they can buy inventory set up a shop and sell products and they struggle with this for so on and suddenly we give them a platform which makes it very 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 easy for them to start a business and grow it and they're working day and night to kind of make that dream possible right so if you ask me 
this women entrepreneur who has struggled all her life who has tried everything possible to achieve that dream even when everything is going against her and she kind of figures it out and scales it up i think those kind of stories really really inspires me the entire company and like i think that's what keeps pushing us to create that next 10x experience so we can enable these 100 million small businesses in india it's great well vidit we really appreciate your time and for talking to us about this uh, and about what misho is doing thanks so much thank you thank you so much Gotta love what Vidit said about getting inspiration from women, and also about how e-commerce gives SMEs a superpower. Now, Nick Molda has had a front row seat to the e-commerce explosion. He was the number one jewelry trader on eBay in Australia before setting up his latest venture, Afterpay. As the co-CEO and co-founder, he ran one of the hottest unicorns in the world last year, offering millennial and Gen Z consumers a buy now, pay later option at online checkouts. Nick joins Bloomberg New Economy editorial director, Andrew Brown, in this What's Next segment. Andy, over to you. Nick, welcome to Bloomberg New Economy Catalyst. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for having me. So the last time we spoke at the Bloomberg New Economy, it was early on in the pandemic and your business was booming. As I recall, you were one of the most successful, if not the most successful startups uh, in the world. Um, here we are uh, a year later and in the US at least, the pandemic is winding down, shops are reopening, but online sales are still accelerating. You are the last click of the online payment system, the buy now, pay later, option. How fast is your business growing right now? Yeah, Andy, look, th thanks for having me. And, you know, as you recall, um, it was a very turbulent time when we met last time. And, you know, if you looked, um, you looked into the future, I don't think any of us could have really anticipated where we are today. But there's been really two distinct trends that have driven you know, our business over the last 12 months. The first, as you described, you know, major shift from offline retail to online retail. And even as, you know, kind of stores reopening online hold its ground and not seeing a huge diminishing of the channel. And secondly, there's been a really major shift away from credit cards to debit cards. So, you know, as we saw during the 2008 financial crisis, that was the first trigger for millennials to say, I'd prefer to spend my own money. And we deep acceleration um, towards debit over, you know, the last 12 month period, given 90% of our consumers use a debit card, not a credit card additive to, to our business growth. Um, as you described, you know, we've grown very quickly, um, you know, pre pandemic and during the pandemic, and I mean, processed a couple billion of volume per month, still growing at, you know, triple digit year on year um, and live in a variety of different uh, countries around the world. So really privileged uh, to partner with some of the best global retail brands and, and we'll go from there. I want to get to that credit debit story in a minute and why your core audience, the millennials and Gen Z, uh, have an aversion to, to credit. But let me ask you this. Um, it seems it seems that the new normal now really is digital. I just saw a headline saying Gwyneth Paltrow has closed down uh, her store in San Francisco. Um, where does all this leave traditional retailing? Does it ever come back? Yeah, I mean, look, interestingly, through our physical retail channel, we've seen a, a pretty material um, you know, comeback of physical retail. I think no matter which way you cut it, physical represent the lion's share of retail over the next few years at least. And so you are seeing retailers very much, particularly in the US, invest in the physical channel as, you know, the world begins to reopen. You know, being from Australia, we saw physical retail open many months ago. Um, you know, certainly what we diminishing of the online channel so you know offline is it when it's come back it's certainly growing the overall retail pie you know what existed previously in retail is now significantly larger as a result um, of you know hospitality and travel you know very much being reduced so 
uh, we still see retail playing a crucial role in the retail world and we're certainly investing into that channel ourselves. So your core customer base, Millennials, Gen Z, are buying fast fashion, beauty. Um, what changes have you seen in the kinds of products that they're buying? And what does this tell us about shifting lifestyle preferences, shifting patterns of work post COVID? Yeah, look at different moments um, during the, the pandemic cycle, we certainly saw different products being bought, you know, whether it was home and outdoor, you know, fitness in the early days or, you know, moving into pets um, and fashion has actually made quite a strong comeback in recent times. We have seen it largely normalise in recent times to, you know, uh, mix similarly pre-pandemic. Um, definitely travel is still suppressed and, you know, naturally, as I mentioned before, the share of wallet from hospitality is also um, is also down, but you're seeing lead indicators of a strong recovery in that regard, particularly, you know, in, in North America. Um, so, yeah, we've seen, we're seeing at the moment it, it very much new, uh, normalized to, to more recent, to, to previous pre-pandemic levels. So you're offering buy now, pay later through Apple Pay, through Google Pay, which sounds like it could be encouraging a reckless kind of impulse buying, but you claim it actually encourages responsible shopping, responsible spending. How do you come to that conclusion? Yeah, it's a really important topic and, you know, goes back to this preference millennials away from credit to debit card. So, you know, when the 2008 financial crisis hit, I just turned 18 and the world said, the world said don't spend money you don't have. And if you think about it, if 100% of people pay back a credit card on time, the industry simply doesn't work. Doesn't it doesn't exist? So incentives are completely misaligned. Where a you know a finance product's incentive is for someone to remain outstanding for as long as possible, be revolving in interest for as long as possible, and that's how income is earned. You know we shifted the economics around where you know we charge the retailer a small fee, uh, which means it can be fundamentally free for the consumer, and it also means at the moment that that someone goes late on our platform, they can't actually keep shopping until they pay that late payment back. So they can never revolve in debt. Um, our loss rates over the last six month period was 0.7 of a percent, which is many multiples less, you know, other, other credit card providers that sit at more kind of three to 6%. So we're really proud of, you know, the way we've designed the product and, and the outputs that have subsequently unfolded. Research from the Pew organization shows that Gen Z has an aversion to credit after watching their parents get into trouble and really struggle financially during the 2008 financial crisis. Is that what, is that what you see? Is that how you might partly explain your success? Without a doubt, absolutely. You know, when I grew up during the 2008 financial financial crisis, there was this distinct shift away from credit to to debit. And, you know, we watched the trend for quite a number of years, you know, me and my co-founder in an afterpay. And, you know, it's kind of obvious in hindsight, but uh, this debit trend continued to amplify as and Gen Z simply earned more income in the economy. So now um, debit card usage is incredibly strong. I mean, if you look back in May last year, you had um, credit cards with negative 21% year on year growth, but debit cards in the you know peak of the pandemic had positive year on year growth. There was systemic shift away from credit to debit and, it, and it's only continued to get stronger. Um, you are definitely seeing Gen Z have a material greater aversion towards credit than millennials, but millennials is even greater as compared to you know Gen X and older during the pandemic, the greatest shift away from credit to debit was actually in Gen X and boomers. So you're seeing this trend go way more mainstream as people prefer to spend their own money. 
this, this idea that Gen Z are, are responsible is is spenders is, is somewhat at odds with some of the crazier financial trends we've seen during the pandemic. I'm I'm thinking of all these. Uh, jet, 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 Gen Z folks flocking onto Robin Hood and taking a punt on AMC and 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 Dogecoin. Yeah, I think that what's happening is this consumer base is at the forefront of all of the new revolutions that are occurring right now. Um, they're being forced to think about their finances in a different way and being forced to manage their money. Um, in a way that was different to all previous generation. I mean, the income to property price gap has never been greater and, you know, they're forced to work out how they're going to forge their own path. Um, the two examples that you just described for me is a really important moment where this next generation consumer is such an important force in the economy that you know, their preferences are becoming the trend. You know, I would say that there are examples of, you know, protest um, showing progress and how sustainable or where that ends up is certainly, you know, up for debate. And you've seen a lot of volatility as a result of that. But what you have seen is, you know, the traditional world be completely shifted upside down when this particular cohort decides that, you know, this is something that they believe in and they want to they want to show, you know, their passion and, and, you know, their loyalty behind. You're seeing that unfold in an incredibly meaningful way, in a way that has never occurred previously. Last question, Nick. You've seen the whole arc of digital commerce. As has Linda mentioned, you were the most successful trader of jewellery on eBay. Uh, now you're at the the cutting edge, the leading edge of this latest iteration in, in e-commerce. What are the big trends coming that we should pay attention to? Retailers are the most focused on at the moment is, you know, today millennial and Gen Z represent about 30% of all spend in the retail economy. But in seven years time, they'll represent 50% of all spend in the retail economy. So just like, as you mentioned, AMC and Dogecoin are seeing, you know, these, these rallies as a result of certain brands really get leverage and influence when they adequately engage with this next generation consumer. So retailers are really deeply focused on how, you know, they can play their role in attracting this consumer. You know, we, as an example, send a million leads per day from our app to our retail partners. So acting as one of the top marketing channels to those retailers to drive them that consumer beyond the payment method, we can actually be a marketing channel. And I do think that retailers are very focused on that next generation consumer in their strategy because now's the time. Nick Molnar, thanks for being with us and congratulations on becoming a new economy catalyst. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Andy, great conversation there. Now, you may have already heard about the 15-minute cities under development from Paris to Melbourne. Well, in the wake of the pandemic, our next What If Catalyst is pioneering the concept of a one-minute city. The 15-minute city was all about clustering shops, schools, clinics, and government offices together in a walkable neighborhood. The one-minute city focuses on individual streets, the smallest un unit of any community. Well, Kieran Long is the director of Agdes, the Swedish National Center for Art and Design. It's his dream to revive urban life by stressing the value of good neighborliness. The clearest dynamic we have to deal with as people thinking about the future of the city is the polarization of the public conversation, you know, the lack of collective idea of what the city is for. And we think that the streets, that kind of gigantic untapped resource of open space in cities really, is a place where we can really work to transform something that's been reserved for motor cars into something that's an amenity for the whole population, hopefully in a way that can be scalable um, to the whole country and beyond. As countries wonder how to meet their carbon neutral promises, many have also begun to question the future of our cities. 
A popular model is the 15-minute city. It's a vision of a decentralized urban area where your daily needs are within a quarter-hour walk or bike from your home. It promises to cut greenhouse emissions and boost livability. But while Paris works on neighborhoods with a 15-minute radius, and Barcelona explores a similar idea, dividing areas into nine-block chunks, Sweden is taking the hyperlocal concept one step further. The one-minute city idea, of course, uses a buzzy-sounding phrase to talk about the even more local than the hyperlocal scale. You know, the street exactly outside your front door or outside the door of a, a cafe or a business, and how that can be transformed to make additional amenity space, to make public spaces that didn't exist before. This is the Street Moves project, and it allows communities to become architects of their own streets' layouts. It's led by two national government agencies, ArcDES, the National Centre for Architecture and Design, and Vinova, the Swedish government's national innovation agency. I think there's a sort of implicit critique in the project that questions residents and citizens' role in planning processes. We have now these very large-scale formal planning processes in most Western countries um, that make it very hard for individual citizens to influence the outcome of, of urban change. But we know that citizens have really, really strong opinions, especially about their immediate environment. So that method of involving citizens with their hyperlocal, extremely expert knowledge on their environment, but getting that out of their heads and putting it on the table for, for designers, but also for agencies, national agencies, and municipalities. We think there's something really, really valuable in that. Unlike the 15-minute city concept, the Street Moves model isn't about offering every feature of a city at a hyper-local level. Instead, it turns patches of pavement outside our front doors into critical connecting spaces for communities. Through workshops and consultations, residents can control how much street space is used for parking and how much is used for anything else they can think of. It's already been rolled out experimentally at four sites in Stockholm, with three more cities about to join up. The prototypes were designed by Lundberg Design, an industrial design firm here in, in Stockholm. And the, the prototype that exists is a, is a kind of deployable system which runs on three simple tracks which can easily be laid down on the street and then sort of cassettes or sections of timber are laid on top of them and those sections they fit together and create a kind of boardwalk which can be leveled with the pavement of course um, and different kind of elements can can be integrated into them be it seating opportunities for planting cycle storage um, electric scooter storage and later many many other things when you make something in three dimensions by a designer who's skilled at making something beautiful, intriguing, different in a, in a material in this case that's not often seen on the streets in timber, it becomes a talking point. Sweden has committed its cities to becoming carbon neutral by 2045, making a project like Street Moves that de-emphasizes car use more of a feasible prospect. But that's not all that Street Moves wants to address. Of course, the transformation that needs to come to our cities because of the need to, to decrease our carbon use is the most urgent driver for all of the transformations that are coming, especially in Swedish cities. But we use that cover sometimes and we use that huge, undeniable momentum to also have other conversations. And I think it's no accident and no coincidence that alongside the ecological driven transformation that's coming. There's also a socially driven one, be it Black Lives Matters, be it Me Too, be it large scale citizen led movements that are bringing new dynamics to the public conversation. That creates new demands for the city. And I think everybody's starting to realize, you know, the ecological transformation that needs to come is just as much a cultural project as it is technical. Street Move's ultimate goal is ambitious, to rethink and make over every street in Sweden over the next decade. But while this kind of grand transformation might appear to only work for a country like Sweden, Long and the Street Moves team are confident the concept can cross borders. I think the future of scaling up this kind of project internationally will be about using the talent in those individual spaces for what they're good at. In Sweden, we have great skill in industrial design, so that kind of modularity, the materials and so on, really, really good at that. In another country, it might be a completely other set of skills. You know, it might be that the designers take more of a lead on the public conversation than they might do here in Sweden. In the end, what I believe in is that the extraordinary talent that 
is around the world in design and in architecture can play a massively bigger role than it already does in that public conversation, in generating new ideas for how we use our city public spaces. neighborhoods on Earth to communities in space. Elon Musk wants to establish colonies on Mars, although for him, is an escape plan in the event of climate catastrophe. The catalyst that we've assembled look at space very differently for them. It holds the solutions for the world's most intractable problems. It's worth noting that this year, even as the pandemic shut down economies all over the planet, three missions to Mars forged ahead. In this segment, we'll talk to an astronaut who is, at this moment, orbiting 260 miles above Earth. We'll check in with an MIT professor using space technologies to further the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we'll talk to a German entrepreneur bringing down the cost and environmental impact of rocket launches. But first, in this What Matters segment, Bloomberg anchor Manis Cranny catches up with UAE Minister of State for Advanced Technology and Chairwoman of the UAE Space Agency, Her Excellency Sarah Bint Yusuf Al-Amiri. Al-Amiri led the project that took the UAE to Mars, preparing its economy for life after oil. Minister, welcome to Bloomberg. Congratulations on joining the Catalyst community of the New Economy Forum. It's uh, a privilege for us to have this time with you. And uh, well done. You know, I reflect on this year, and this year is the moment, I think, when you caught the, the nation and the world's imagination with the, the Hope probe entering the orbit of Mars. I grew up with the space shuttle, and obviously you're a little bit younger than me, so the space shuttle was the zeitgeist for me on space. What inspired you with science and space? What initially um, inspired me about science and space was the advent of computers, if that makes any sense. I grew up at the time where the internet um, started becoming a norm in households uh, and the computer and the personal computer started becoming a norm in the household. It's not as big as a space shuttle, but it's close enough that to, to have linked me to uh, to uh, the space sector overall and uh, hooked me on computers and designing and developing software. Um, but I'm after witnessing, working on a program of, uh, of sending a probe to Mars and then witnessing and taking a step back in February and witnessing the reaction when that was transformed into a reality. And then now a few months down the line, still seeing the ripple effect of that. And one of the biggest ones, is a normalization of science in, in society and the normalization of, of large risks and having children pick up space books. And I have that in my own household and flipping through it and naming the planets and discussing the differences between them. I never dreamed for that to ever be a reality, but seeing that ripple effect in society today gave a new generation another Apollo mission for an entire region. And that's quite interesting to live through at this time and age um, to see what, what space could actually do. It, it's living through science. And I, I remember the night uh, of the launch in the morning after you joined us. And the images on the Burj Khalifa here in, in Dubai off the Hope Probe. As you say, there are seminal moments. Do you think what you've delivered with the Hope Probe, and there's more to come, and we'll talk about the data and the ripple effect in a moment, but do you think that that will inspire a generation of Emiratis and here in the GCC and beyond to get involved, more involved in space and science? 
we've seen an increase of involvement since the launch. And I can take that all the way back to last year in July. So it's been almost a year. We've seen it be, implicate people quite positively on what's possible and what areas they could work on. And we've seen more and more anecdotally, more and more people interested to enter into STEM and more importantly, more and more people interested to create their own opportunities in the sciences. And the space is one of one of those areas. Um, it's created a ripple effect, but we need to further capitalize on it so that we ensure that science and technology becomes more of a norm, especially in industry and especially in the private sector. Well, tell me a little bit more about how, how you capitalize that, because we're, we're going to expect data to come back from the whole probe. So just update us. What, what kind of data can we expect? And how do you take data and data flow from this mission and convert it to business? So on the perspective of this mission, the three instruments on the spacecraft, spacecraft are up and operating nominally. So they're imaging uh, Mars at the right times that they are meant to be imaging. And they're sending us back data, which is sort of what we thought the data would look like, which is good news now, especially early on the mission. The science team right now is looking into parts of those data sets so that we make sure that it's ready for uh, release and observing, um, observing different aspects um, of Mars and the daily changes to the Martian atmosphere uh, as we move forward. We expect the data to be released to the public in the first week of October. Now, how do we take a scientific mission? So this is a scientific mission. It, it, it provides knowledge to the global science community about transformations about a, uh, about a planet's atmosphere. How does that then go and implicate an economy? And how does that go and, and establish a space industry? And it goes back to the start of this mission. The start of this mission was about diversifying the economy and it was about taking engineers uh, to design and develop complex autonomous systems that not only gives them the skills and the know-how to do that for the space sector, but the skills and the know-how to do that across different sectors that require complex technological systems. What does that mean? One of the first prongs of establishing any industry based on technology is talent and the creation of opportunities for engineers and the know-how and the experience in that area. The other aspects is what we're working on today, developing the capability and capacity for businesses, so creating the, creating the right business environment for the space sector, and this is today what the space agency is focusing on, ensuring that your regulations, your policies, your support mechanisms is supportive of a very risky business in space. And those are the aspects that we are currently focusing on to, 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 to turn that data from a scientific mission into impactful outcomes for the economy. So if, if I look at the context of space, we always think in sort of huge projects, um, very physical infrastructure heavy. When you think of space, you think of uh, the, 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 the SpaceX launch just a couple of weeks ago, the imagery of the space shuttle. But what kind of space businesses do you want to attract to the UAE? And what are you offering them? What's your ministry? out there telling the world definitely not those larger ones which which i call the traditional space business there is a new space business that is up and coming and it's actually focused more and more on making what was big smaller and what was uh specialized and very bespoke for particular needs and uses to being more accessible so more of production that is not specific. So spacecrafts that you can use it for multiple uses and multiple clients. Uh, data becoming part of, ev evidently part of the space sector. So you don't need to be in the space business and own any satellites or any ground station. All you're doing is producing products and services from the space sector. That is the business that we're capitalizing on. And for those that want those heavy infrastructure. So if you need access to a clean, clean room per se, or ground stations, we are looking to having those as services uh, rather than providing that overhead to these companies to be established. Look, grabbing the headlines are people like Jeff Bezos getting ready to go to space, Elon Musk, I, I could let Richard Branson, to you, who are the most creative thinkers in your industry? Those are the headliners, but there must be other people that have been involved in the journey of inspiration, who are they? The people that I've worked with on the Emirates Mars mission, especially very, very early on, and it's the rebels of the space sector. Uh, those that take what has been done before and what is considered a norm in a sector that has existed globally for decades now, 
and thrown it out of the door and established a new mechanism by which we can approach design and development. And it was very risky for us to do this on an exploration project where the odds of success is only 50%. Uh, but, but those are the people that are driving innovation. And I've been quite privileged to work with, with such people that, that approach space in, in that mechanism. And, and the first thing we did on the first day was relooked how these missions are designed and developed. And this has allowed us to create a mechanism by which we increase success in creating such innovative changes to approach. It is the Bloomberg Catalyst New Economy Forum. So it would be very remiss not to ask you a Bloomberg question, which is how much have you spent on space innovation so far? And what's your bang for your space buck going to be? In terms of implications and spillovers of the space sector, it's it's not it's very hard to come up with an ROI number because space what it does beautifully not only develops capabilities, which is very hard to put a number on, but creates a ripple effect in society that's very hard to measure. But you know anecdotally the kind of impact that it does. But on the space on the scope of the uh, just to provide a bit of context in terms of the projects and how much budgets we give for projects, the Emirates Mars mission was given about two hundred million dollars. Uh, in comparison, that's about half what other similar spacecrafts would get. So we're going to very cost effective and we're actually driving innovation through cost and timeline um, so that the teams look at reinventing the mechanism by which you design and develop. And that's something that we're taking into consideration. So that factor of reduction in cost is what we're taking into consideration when we're uh, funding different projects and programs. Now, if I look at this project and I look at, you know, how did we get to where we are, the Koreans were the main technology transfer partner for you, the Japanese, the main launch partner for you. I want to get a sense. So it's a very Asia pivot. So how important is China, let's say, the third leg on that suit? How important is China to the UAE's space development program? The next steps. So just on, on the aspect of the space program, we started with South Korea, but continued on the Emirates Mars mission with the U.S., um, in terms of, of of development, so we've taken actually the the best of three three segments of the world. We worked very well with with Asia and South Korea and Japan. We worked also on other programs with Europe and on the Emirates Mars mission with uh, um, with uh, the U.S. Now the approach to development and the approach to selection of partners is the actual aspect of mutual benefit and, and furthering the advent of space uh, technological capabilities, not only for the Emirates, but also for our counterparts. And that's the mechanism by which we go approach selection of partners. And it's done on a program by program basis. And I mean, you mentioned the, the two countries which were not competing, but similarly uh, on the same mission, the US uh, and likewise yourselves and then there's China as well. Do you do do you see yourself working with the U.S. and with China sim simultaneously? Is there a road forward to work again with with both countries? There's no program today that is that is in place uh, to work uh, jointly with with China. But we do look on the science front. So once the data becomes available, you do speak to different missions, and that's something that's normal in the space exploration field. Uh, with the U.S., our science team still has uh, U.S. scientists together with uh, with our researchers from the Emirates. So collaboration still continues on that front. And as we move forward, we haven't ruled down. We haven't zoned in and on any one partner and we haven't ruled down any one partner at the end of the day it's what's beneficial to the programs to both entities and what's beneficial to the space sector overall i think what is collaboration really isn't it it's not just about your information but it's about the, the the global syncopation what do you think the biggest breakthrough is going to be i know you signed on to the biden initiative about investigating climate um what do you think the biggest breakthrough is going to be in the next decade in space the biggest break breakthrough would be more players for collaboration. As much as there's competition in the space sector, it's one of the biggest sectors that I've seen a large collaboration in, in, in on top of uh, in, on top of the competition. And what that enables is different facets by which we're able to create impact, but also transform. One of the biggest things that I'm looking forward to is a transformation in the approach that we take to exploring outer space, the approach that we take in using science data. So you mentioned the climate change there's a lot of data uh, that's being captured from space that people can capitalize on and enter into the space sector without owning any asset. That has removed a large overhead and has removed a large hurdle to entering to the space sector. So that those are major breakthroughs. I know they're, they're, they sound quite 
micro in terms of, uh, of their implication and impact, uh, but they will create a large transformation on increasing the significance of the space sector to other sectors. Do you think, if I look at you, your title, Minister, you're not just the you're not just Minister of State for the Space Agency, but also for Advanced Sciences, and I think that belies maybe something which we should just close off on, which is when you sign up to something like this Biden initiative on climate, how inspiring do you think that is, not just for Emiratis, but for people here in the GCC about participating at a global level in a global challenge? It's one thing we've learned that when you're talking about science and technology, especially through the pandemic, it no longer becomes the capabilities of any one country. It's something that implicates and impacts all of our lives. So research development, the utilization of science outcomes and research outcomes is not beneficial to any one entity and it's not border reliant. And we need to continuously as societies remind ourselves that that is the case, that science benefits all, research outcomes benefit all, especially when you're translating it into areas with societal implications. And that's what, what is important about any sector that we work, where we work on. There is the, the interest of developing your economy. There is the interest of developing your businesses. But at the same time, in science and tech, there's also the interest of developing the wider global, uh, the global stance. It's about increasing humanity's knowledge. And we need to continuously balance between programs, especially on the level of governments across the world, balance the programs between what is of interest locally, what is of interest from a political perspective and an economic perspective, but also what is on interest societally, but global, uh, from the global perspective. Let's just close off with, with a question, which I, I'm sure you're asked very often, but we're in a more relaxed environment here, and I'm curious. Um, if I can't, I don't want to be it. Of course, I'm talking about diversity and as a woman in science. Are you leading the charge? Do you feel that you, you're carrying this uh, flag or, or uh, issue for women in terms of science, for young women around the world, this woman in charge of the space program so they can see it, they can be it? Well, my short answer to that is no. Um, I, I, I don't want to carry such a, a, um, such a label. Um, because it, it lowers the impact that every woman has had in the STEM field who has earned uh, their role and their position and their jobs and their, uh, their impact. What we're all working towards and what we all need to continuously working on is diversity in science creates large impact and outcome, and that's scientifically proven. There's no argument there. So it has to be anyone that's working working in STEM, anyone that's working in science and technology needs to have that underlined in the back of their head on everything that they're working on. The diversity is important for the betterment of scientific outcomes. And then that becomes the the ethos by which I work and, and a lot of people that are in this field uh, work by to ensure that you're not leaving anyone behind. Broad Church, Broad Minds delivers inspiration. Minister, thank you very much for joining us. Congratulations again uh, on joining the Bloomberg Catalyst program for the New Economy Forum. Thank you. And the minister talked about rebels in the space sector. Well, in the last year, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos have become the faces of space exploration with their plans to make space tourism available to the ultra rich. Our next guest is more focused on absolute poverty and the needy communities around the world that might benefit most from space technologies applied to agriculture, water conservation and communications. Bloomberg New Economy Editorial Director Andy Brown spoke to Dr. Danielle Wood, Assistant Professor and Director of the Space and Able Research Group at MIT Media Lab about her very down-to-earth vision of space. Dr. Wood, your vision of space is very firmly connected to Earth. As an MIT professor, you study space as a way to advance the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Is that vision of space in conflict with the vision of an Elon Musk or a Jeff Bezos who look at space uh, as a tourist destination? Jeff Bezos, as you know, is planning to blast off into space on an adventure ride next month. Is there a contradiction there or in some way um, are these two visions complementary? Let's start by considering the history of human activity in space 
and celebrating that the early years of the space program, both in the United States, but also the Soviet Union, countries like Germany and France, although there was competition, there was a lot of important diplomacy that happened. Countries came together and created a series of treaties, identified a few key values that actually have been playing out throughout human activity in space, including the idea that space is the heritage or the province of all humankind, and that all nations uh, and all peoples really deserve to have the benefits of space. So I think of space as a public resource in a similar way to thinking about the oceans, our shared use of the atmosphere, and our use of Antarctica, for example, all places where countries have come together over history and found ways to cooperate together. Now, of course, if you think about the atmosphere and how we use the oceans, there's a mix of activities, some serving the public and some for private good. But you could ask, what's the fundamental reason that we think we have this resource? And I'd like to argue that space in particular is a platform for serving the broad public. We use satellites to observe the environment and the climate. We use satellites to connect people across different parts of the Earth and to give us information about our positions and our weather. All of these are broad public goods that really can serve people across the world all at once. And so for me, I think a lot about what it means to, for space to play a role, both to help us connect in kind of a symbolic way on Earth, but also in a very literal way. And so I think of space firstly as a place of public service rather than a place of commercial gain. Although, of course, it enables economic activity all over the world, and that's something we can also celebrate. But there's an important philosophical difference, is there not? I mean, Elon Musk talks about space as an escape from a dying planet. In this view, humans, I guess the wealthy ones, will set up colonies on Mars and look back at a distant Earth in flames. Um, you, on the other hand, see space as a solution to Earth's problems. Now, part of what I'd like to do today is just really highlight that people are listening, listening closely to the voices of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos because they have money, not because they really represent uh, the core dialogue or the core uh, forces that are shaping our activities in space. So I'd like to broaden the dialogue. For example, when my research team uh, considers who we want to listen to in space, one of the areas we go is to listen to indigenous communities and ask what's their generation's long view of space. We try to listen respectfully. Sometimes we have the chance to celebrate it by making uh, art with them or videos or other ways of celebrating and archiving what they're sharing. But I would just like to expand the voices that have a chance to shape. Also, speaking of science fiction writers, I have a great respect for Octavia Butler and another author that people may be familiar with is Nedia Korfor, both black women writing about space in a way that causes us to think differently about what it means to be human. So I'd love for these voices to be expanded and kind of balancing out some of the voices that are getting a lot of media attention right now. My goal is to ask, how do we achieve sustainability both on Earth and wherever humans choose to roam in space? And sustainability means we are treating in a fair and long-term viable way both our social system, meaning treating people as humans across different identities, our economic system, and our environmental system. We have not yet achieved this on Earth. I think we must continue to strive for it. And I hope that as humans get started with more and more activity in space, we seek to balance sustainability across these three areas. Well, let me ask you that question then. In practical terms, how does space advance the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Can you give me a few examples? I love giving examples of the ways that space technology supports sustainable development. And in particular, it's been convenient to use the Sustainable Development Goals from the United Nations as a nice checklist of which things we're trying to address. In my own work, for example, I'm often working on Sustainable Development Goal number 15. This focuses on life on land and asks, including other questions, it asks the question, can we ensure that our forests and our other biodiversity on land, as well as on the coasts, is healthy? I have projects right now, for example, with colleagues who are leading activities in coastal cities, especially in West Africa, including in the country of Benin and Ghana, as well as in South America, including in Rio de Janeiro and in Indonesia. In each of these areas, we're asking, how can we support local governments and companies that are working toward sustainable environments in areas where the ocean and the land meet, especially addressing the management of important forests like mangroves? And we use satellite data, along with data from measurements taken on the ground and in the water, to understand what are the important trade-offs and making plans to help preserve important trees, other species, and to address invasive plants. All of this is important to coastal resilience in cities that are on the coast, especially those affected by climate change right now. 
This year, even as COVID ripped through the developing world, including India, Brazil, the world was mesmerized by three separate Mars missions, one from the United States, one from China, one from the United Arab Emirates. Um, what message do those missions send to an Earth in crisis? So in my doctoral studies, I studied the early space programs of several countries in Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, and Asia, including the United Arab Emirates. So over the last 15 years, I've been observing that countries on every single continent around the world are dedicating themselves to being involved with space, and many have been developing programs to operate and build their own satellites and engage in other ways. So I wasn't at all surprised to see the UAE arrive at Mars. Ten years ago, I was visiting their early space activities and seeing how they were quickly learning uh, skills by collaborating with other more experienced space actors. And this is happening all over the world. So going forward, I hope people are celebrating each time a country reaches a new milestone. These are milestones not just for one country, but really for, for humanity, especially because space has always been collaborative. Any major space endeavor has always involved more than one country. And it's true of Mars missions as well. Anytime one country arrives at Mars, multiple countries are involved. Is space the new industrial frontier? Is there, is space where we're going to mine for metals, set up factories, uh, power stations? Um, and if so, is there a danger that humankind will simply export its pollution uh, to outer space? I am always driven by history when trying to understand what might come in the future. And I've been reflecting on the ways that over the last 500 years or so, we've invented technologies like the ocean-going vessel that can carry a lot of cargo and, and also people, as well as technologies that came during the Industrial Revolution. And unfortunately, our pattern so far as humans has been to use these technologies to quickly try to expand economic activity, but not necessarily to consider the long-term impacts on human laborers or on the environment. So I am urging us to now think historically, and before we go forth and try similar methods of expansion of technology in space, I hope we ask, how can we do so with basically zero waste? If you think about a space station, we have the International Space Station in orbit now, it has a goal to aspire toward recycling, recycling air, so you breathe in oxygen, breathe out carbon dioxide, and there's systems that actually extract more oxygen so you can breathe it again, recycling water, and then being able to eventually, this is not ready yet, but eventually be able to generate uh, food uh, right there on orbit. These are practices that will help us move toward uh, using everything to generate what we need and thinking of really nothing as waste. We need to start inventing that in a radical way, both for our life on Earth and for the expanded human activities we probably will see in the next few years in space. Only when we think that way, will we start to be moving towards sustainability I think the default is actually that we just continue what we normally do on Earth, which is create a lot of uncontrolled waste streams. And this is already happening in orbit around the Earth. So my team works heavily on the topic of space debris. In fact, we just announced this past week a major milestone in a project called the Space Sustainability Rating. The Space Sustainability Rating is going to respond to the urgent crisis of a large amount of space debris of human objects already in orbit around the Earth. There are hundreds of thousands of objects, if not more, uh, that we uh, some we can observe and some we can't. And these are left over from human missions where we have discarded waste already in orbit around the Earth. And right now it looks like we're poised to have the similar behavior when we start doing more activities on places like the moon and asteroids. Rather than that, what if we challenged ourselves to basically create processes where recycling, reuse, and the idea of thinking everything is actually valuable material, nothing's really trash. What if that was our driver as we move to places and, and work more on the moon? I also encourage us to consider the same way that we celebrate on Earth, places that are geologically and culturally valuable. We set aside areas as parks, like the Grand Canyon, for example, and we plan to not have pollution there or minimize pollution. And we plan to have it as a, a refuge and a place of enjoyment for generations to come. I think we need similar kinds of zoning, so to speak, <laughs> on the moon. Uh, something that's actually not really well defined in international space law, but it could be defined by consensus among spacefaring organizations that we want to keep some places uh, for example, on the moon that we know are geologically really interesting or have uh, sacred meaning for certain cultures and plan to not pollute them. This is quite doable if we move it forward. In your writings and public speeches, you talk about space in the context of justice. Can you explain that connection? 
Um, and how does this concept of justice relate to your own identity as an African American woman? I am constantly redefining my definition of justice and refining it, drawing from authors who are queer black feminist, because I think their definition of justice is good for everyone. If you look at some of the authors, especially I referenced the Combahee River Collective, who was active just a few miles from where I am right now in Boston, and they wrote a manifesto highlighting the need for thinking about people as intersectional beings, meaning we are all individuals with identities, multiple ways of knowing ourselves. I'm a woman, I'm a professor, I'm a homeowner, uh, also somebody whose great grandfather was born enslaved in North Carolina. So I carry all these identities with me at all times, but of course, different forms of those affect my life in different ways, and that changes throughout my day. So I ask how to use this way of thinking, intersectional thinking, as we ask how are our technologies and our policies, our approaches to sustainability, shaping justice. And this is a vital part of designing my research organization and designing how we pursue justice using space technology. Two quick questions to close. I have to ask you this. Do you think that there's intelligent life on other planets? Now, it's a great question in part because we are discovering so many other planets, not myself personally, but of course our space community over the last few decades has identified so many uh, planets, that some of which appear to have a lot in common with Earth in terms of how far they are from the sun they're orbiting and the potential shape and maybe the atmosphere. I think we really know very little about what's happening and who might be uh, doing activities around the galaxies. But what's interesting next will be for us to ask the question, has there ever been life that we can recognize with our limited definition of life on Mars? There's flowing water on Mars, seasonally flowing, and there's strong evidence of past lakes and uh, areas that water could have been in great concentrations. So our very next question that we can understand is could we recognize life in the form that we know, uh, or at least the fossils of it on Mars? That would already be revolutionary to our understanding. Dr. Danielle Wood, it's been a real privilege talking with you. Thank you so much for your time and for your insights. Thank you. Uh, fascinating to think about intelligent life in other planets. Well, before we get to our next catalyst, I want to ask our audience this polling question, and it is, what excites you most about space? Is it mass space travel and tourism? as Elon Musk puts it, the possibility of discovering life forms on other planets, the economic potential of shifting mining energy generation and industrial production into space, or is it about colonizing other planets like Mars? So we would like you to get involved. Take a moment to answer that poll if you're on our platform in the box on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'll read out the results in just a few minutes. Now for our first What's Next segment, SWARM. It's a space startup launching a constellation of microsatellites that will offer connectivity at unbelievably affordable prices to every corner of the Earth. It's a great example of how fundamental advances in science and technology are finding applications that can transform the global economy. Joining me now is Sarah Spengelo, the co-founder and CEO of SWOM. Uh, Sarah, welcome to the program and congratulations on uh, being named a new economy catalyst. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. Now, we know that SWARM was founded out of frustration over a lack of connectivity options at low cost. I mean, so here we are with uh, the smallest satellite in space today at the cheapest possible price. Talk to us about, about how this is the new paradigm for communication. Yeah, absolutely. So you're absolutely right. We have the smallest two-way communication satellites in space. We actually launched 28 today, so we have 120 um, that creates this constellation around the Earth, providing coverage of every point on Earth several times a day. Um, and what we're doing is we're able to offer uh, satellite connectivity, so being able to connect devices any point on the planet at all times for only $5 a month. Um, conventionally, that's been about 20x um, higher. So we're able to bring that price point down and bring a lot of people online for the first time that could never afford satellite before. So when all your 150 satellites are deployed in space, what would it mean for the world? What would it mean for businesses, the rural areas, developing countries, critical industries? What can we expect? 
Yeah, definitely. So um, even today we have a commercial service that's up and operating um, and we connect um, devices all over the world in a bunch of different industries, agriculture, logistics, ground transportation, maritime, fire detection, tracking vaccines to ensure that things stay within temperature ranges, making sure that rainforests are protected. There's a million super interesting um, examples that we learn about every day. And basically we're able to bring back small amounts of very valuable data uh, from any point on earth at all times and allow business owners and decision makers to um, make really informed decisions about how they should run their businesses. We also ensure that people are safe wherever they might be and can always kind of call home. Um, it's, it's not really a phone service, but they can tweet home or send a message home um, to ensure their, you know, their safety and that we know where everyone is at all times. Uh, we know, if I got it right, your satellites offer lower speed data service compared with what's being offered by other companies right now. What's the value of lower speed data service? What can it change potentially? Yeah, so the fact that it's so low cost, um, it's also low speed, and we transfer small amounts of super valuable data. Um, and this allows um, people, wherever they might be, you know, wherever their assets might be, anywhere on the planet, to bring back data. And we believe this can have a tremendous impact on the infrastructure of connectivity um, and allow people to um, bring back you know, data, make informed decisions, and um, potentially run their businesses differently. Uh, size matters, at least uh, where satellites are concerned. You're able to offer low prices for two-way communication satellite services because you've shrunk the size of the satellite. Do the satellites get bigger? or smaller from here as you get more funding? Give us a sense of the trend going forward. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, obviously our satellites have shrunk down and we've been able to offer this incredible service because of the launch economics. So the smaller the satellite, the lower cost it is to launch. Um, and then we can share those cost savings with our users. Um, as we think to the future, um, you know, people want smaller and smaller devices on the ground, smaller antennas, lower power. Um, and the physics kind of says that if you make stuff smaller and lower powered on the ground, the devices in space have to get bigger or have more power. So that's kind of the trade-off that we're dealing with. Um, so I think that we're probably going to see our satellites get a little bit bigger, but be way more powerful and offer this incredible service um, that is something like the size of your cell phone or maybe eventually even into your cell phone um, in terms of connectivity. Hopefully that's going to help us in uh, transmitting live when we're in some rural areas at some point as well, because right now it's super <laughs> expensive to, to, have, to have news, you know, travel through satellite. You know, totally. what's your own aspiration, Sarah? I mean, what comes after launching 150 satellites in space? What are some of the ideas? Yeah, you know, I think at this point, we almost have this global network that we aspire to build. Um, and it's really about trying to figure out how we can best serve our customers. So how can we get devices in their hands? How can we develop products that they will integrate into existing devices or even create new products that we've never heard of before for the first time? So we are really focused on, on actually the ground segment and making that experience as seamless as picking up um, an Android phone and going through the Google Fi um, kind of data platform, making it that easy, even for industrial applications. We think that that makes um, it easier for more companies on the commercial side, as well as on the commercial side or on the um, consumer side to adopt the technology. Uh, Sarah, I have the polling results right now. And the question, just to remind you, what excites you most about space? We have 33% of our viewers choosing mass space travel and tourism. 42% the possibility and discovering other life forms on other planets, 17% uh, for the economic potential of shifting mining, energy generation, and industrial production into space, and 8% colonizing other planets like Mars. So overwhelming response when it comes to the, uh, the possibility and discovering other life forms and planets that links back to our previous conversation, which Andy had about how, you know, we want to discover perhaps maybe some intelligent life forms uh, in other planets. Your own choice would be, Sarah? 
my own choice would not be on that list. <laughs> my choice would be how can we, my choice would be something along the lines of how can we improve life on earth uh, through space? And I think that that is something we're, we're on the brink of really, um, really exploring. So GPS system, something we take for granted every day to navigate around is a, is a space system. I think swarm with our low cost connectivity can help change how we think of comms on the earth. And there's a bunch of other environmental monitoring, climate change, um, many other great applications of things we can do from space that we can't do from the ground to improve life on Earth. So that's really what I'm most excited about. Sorry, it's not on your list. <laughs> <laughs> we'll include that the next time. I'm just wondering, you say we're on the cusp of that. I mean, how soon do you think that will happen? Yeah, I think that we're going to see some major changes in connectivity over the next five to 10 years. Just how we go from our homes where we have Wi-Fi to outside in a city where we have cell and it, it kind of switches automatically. I think we're going to experience that with satellite. You'll go out into the forest and your phone will, automatic, will automatically switch over to satellite. Maybe that will be Swarm um, or some other system. And we'll totally take that for granted. I also think we'll take for granted that we can track people and assets regardless of where they are on the planet. There's a lot of people and aircraft and container ships and dogs and kids and scooters and bikes that go missing. Um, and that's insane. And that should never happen again. And I think with Swarm and other people from the community that are developing these technologies, we're, we're not going to see that anymore, which is pretty cool, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. Uh, suffice <laughs> to say, there is a space fever going on, right? More than a dozen startups building their own networks of nano satellites, all enabling a new kind of connectivity around the clock for everything, like you said, uh, on the planet. Uh, is this necessarily a good thing? Is there anything to be concerned about? Yeah, I mean, I think there is actually hundreds of startups doing different things. I think there's tens in the kind of CubeSat IoT space. I actually view it as a nice validation that there are a lot of investors and entrepreneurs and ideas um, that you know people want to explore and that people are getting the funding and support to explore. So I see it as all really positive. Um, I think there's probably a lot of kind of noise in the space. People like to talk about paper satellite companies or paper rocket companies that's not quite real, but hey, we all start on paper before we get stuff into space. Um, I think what we're probably going to see is a lot of um, kind of synergies or um, companies will start to combine. They'll, you know, one will acquire the other or the talent will kind of combine into a, a single company. And I think that's all for the better as well. If the technologies are synergistic and if they can bring more to the world, if they're bigger together than kind of individually. Throw forward three to five years. How do you see the future of connectivity evolving in that period? Yeah, definitely. So I think it's it's kind of what I said before. I hope in five years we just go between Wi-Fi cell and um, some sort of satellite um, in an auto magic way, um, and that you know it, the the cost of satellite is at a point where it's quite similar to cellular or at least cellular IoT today, and businesses can decide to invest in just the one of those that they need um, and are able to scale out their businesses across the globe without connectivity being a limiting factor. I think we're also going to see other networks come along that will have higher capacity, lower latency, um, better security features, all sorts of great things that you know consumers as well as industrial users want. Um, and I, I know that Swarm will be part of that. And I think you'll see improvements in connectivity and um, it, it will become seamless, which um, I hope we don't have to think about it really. <laughs> kind of goes away. Uh, only we talked about you know, what excites you the most about the future of technology? What about the dangers that science and technology can be misused? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a massive topic. I'm not sure that I'm qualified to, to fully address that. I think that as entrepreneurs, it's, it's really important to think about, you know, the good ways my technology could be used and the bad ways and recognize that, you know, you can never 100% mitigate against all of those possible outcomes. The only way to do that would be to not develop the technology that also does a lot of good. Um, so we try to be thoughtful about, you know, how are we thinking about security? How are we thinking about how we're entering other countries um, and, and really trying to offer a global service? So that's kind of one of our challenges um, and play out kind of worst case scenarios and put in place all of the mitigations that are reasonable um, and, and weigh that with some of the, sometimes it's a, a business downside to, to do the right thing and the secure thing. Um, and we always try to be really thoughtful of, of how we're building things. 
Sarah, keep inspiring us. Sarah Spangolo, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Now, commercial space launch companies like SpaceX and Virgin Galactic have dramatically uh, lowered the cost of sending rockets into space. Our next catalyst aims to add even more capacity, efficiency, and sustainability to the business of launching rockets by offering a fast taxi for smaller satellite launches. Bloomberg reporter Thomas Seal caught up with a German startup ISA Aerospace's co-founder and CEO Daniel Metzler for this What's Next segment. Daniel, it's a pleasure to speak to you. Good to be here, thanks for having me. So, ESAR is a launch company and part of a wave of startups in so-called new space. And it's got some backing from serious investors, uh, including Early Bird Venture Capital. Daniel, could you briefly introduce us to what ESAR does and how you're different to some of the competition? Yeah, so we built orbital launch vehicles focused on small satellites and satellite constellations, meaning we actually design, test, and manufacture, and then also operate rockets uh, which transport small and medium satellites up to about a thousand kilogram into Earth orbit. And over the course of the past three years, um, since we've founded ESAR, um, we've been growing quite a bit. Um, we're very vertically integrated. And so we literally are uh, having hundreds of rocket engineers at the company here um, to actually build basically what we like to say, the small and fast taxi to orbit so that we can really enable small satellite manufacturers to access space very flexibly with respect to time, but also at very low cost. And I know sustainability is an important part of what ESA does. Can you tell me a little bit about that as well? Yeah, sure. So there's actually a lot of different parts about sustainability. On the first part is actually our customer satellite that we put into orbit, um, which are a lot of Earth observation satellites, which actually help manage the Earth's climate. So how do we even know about climate change that's going on? And it's actually satellites which gave us the data in the first place. And you can't manage what you can measure. So in the first place, really, we have to actually get the data through satellites. And then within the rocketry itself, um, we're using a sustainable set of propellants. Um, so we actually get rid of solid propellants. Uh, we don't pollute too much. Um, it's a very high performing uh, liquid oxygen and liquid propane rocket um, that also is very sustainable in terms of the actual fuel that we use. And then on top of that, um, we also don't create any space debris. So we don't leave any upper stages in orbit, and we really want to make sure that space stays clean and free from any debris from our site, so we can actually use orbits sustainably also in the next 100 years. Right, because there's going to be tens of thousands of satellites going up and down um, in the coming decades, so that, that's really important. And how is the, how is the fuel more sustainable, just uh, very briefly on, on that? So in that case, we have a very, very light hydrocarbon, um, which we can just um, burn extremely cleanly. And we don't basically create any soot or black carbon um, through the combustion. So that actually means because soot is one of the big drivers of um, Earth's climate um, and actually acts as a quite heavy greenhouse gas. Uh, um, so we really can make sure that we don't put out too many emissions, especially black carbon, into the higher atmosphere layers where our rocket is flying. So we usually fly up to about 500 kilometers in altitude where we deploy our customer satellites. Okay. And the parts of the rocket, the fairings, they don't leave any debris. So do they, they burn up somehow? Exactly. So the fairing in the first stage will basically return to Earth. Um, but the second stage, upon deployment of the satellites in Earth orbit, um, it would just uh, burn up basically. So we slow it down, we deorbit the second stage, and then it burns up in the atmosphere. And Actually, when, when you think about a rocket, um, it starts even way earlier. So already when you actually build the rocket, um, how sustainable can you actually manufacture a rocket? And there we're using technologies such as additive manufacturing, where we literally just use the material without any excess material um, to actually print layer by layer and all of the material and powder around from a laser melting process, we can actually reuse. So there's barely any uh, not used material that we would have to actually have to throw away. So we can really use all of the materials in a sustainable way as well. Right, I see. And so you're already speaking to potential clients for ESA. What kinds of services and applications, new technologies from those potential clients look the most 
imminent and promising to you? So we've already signed customers such as Airbus Defence and Space um, for their rights to orbit. In that case, we see a lot of Earth observation, but also connectivity um, customers. So it's all about making sure that we have IoT connectivity and the big, big driver there in basically the entire space industry has really been commercialization and the standardization of satellite components so that literally you could build communication satellites, whether it's IoT or whether it's actually a high-speed internet providing satellite, um, Earth observation or radar satellite with which we can actually analyze what's happening on Earth with a very, very high um, both time frequency, but also with a very detailed geographic um, uh, resolution so we can actually get very detailed insights into Earth and into our planet. We can actually build a business model on top of that. There's a wide variety of business cases which our customers are acting on. And we really need to make sure that we can get them to orbit within a very short amount of time at low cost. And, um, and there's also a potential automotive uh, link, isn't there? They're going to be increasingly relying on, on space as well, I think. Absolutely. I mean, imagine if you could just connect every single car on Earth or if you want to push a software update on every car that's driving on the planet and you can basically just broadcast that um, to the entire globe of single car manufacturers. I think the possibilities of space are really endless in the sense of applications and it's just up to the human minds and, and creative engineers uh, to really come up with very, very powerful business models. I think connectivity definitely is one of the big drivers, especially if you think about 4 billion people as of today do not have internet access, which is crazy actually when you think about it. And satellites naturally as they are, um, are orbiting Earth at a low Earth orbit uh, every about 90 minutes. So every 90 minutes uh, basically the satellite does one revolution, meaning same satellite can offer services in Europe, but also in US, in Africa or in Asia. And now if you put as many satellites in orbit that you would always have a satellite covering every single part on Earth, you can then offer a time continuous service on a global scale. And that's really where the very, very neat thing of space is coming in. The entire planet is your market right away. And you've decided to go for the launch and launch equipment uh, market rather than services initially. So is, do you see that as the most promising business case? Is there going to be a bit of a bottleneck, a bit of a long queue to get things in and out of space, do you think? I think it's definitely the first part of the entire value chain we need to get right. If we don't have a uh, low cost and time flexible launch, everything thereafter in the entire space industry, including all of the applications which build on top of the satellite data, is going to be slow and also expensive. So once we have a low cost and time flexible space access, we can actually double down on the actual applications that we can do. And so we really thought when we started three years ago, and especially also out of Europe, we need to have our sovereign launch capability, especially focused on the small satellite. So when you take a look right now at the global market, most of the satellites are actually just weighing 20, 50, maybe 150 or 200 kilograms. They're not these five tons or 10 ton birds anymore. And so you really want to, to have that right. You really want to be flexible and don't want to have your satellites sitting on the ground for two years because there's not enough cool passengers on the flight of a big rocket to actually go to a specific orbit. So the flexibility and the development timelines and cycles within the space industry, it can become much, much faster. And everything that's going afterwards in the value chain can become way more efficient if the launch is already enabling that. Right, I see. And uh, Daniel, zooming out a little bit, what or who was it that inspired you to start ESAR in the first place? What, what made you feel that it could be possible? So we have been uh, developing rocket engines at the Technical University of Munich before. We've been building small satellites, which still today orbit Earth at about 500 kilometers altitude. Uh, we've built Hyperloop pods, which won all of the space access competitions. And so that already gave us a very good hands-on mentality and set of tools to actually go into such a development. The big driver in the entire space industry, I think definitely SpaceX has been in just showing that it is possible. 
And first, we're super proud that we've also been able to raise a massive amount of private capital to actually enable that new era of small satellite launch, whereas we can then really just build the entire vehicles fully privately and offer the launch services to our customers, which actually is quite a bit different from what is being done today in Europe, where all of the institutional missions are just given to that one single satellite manufacturing launch service provider. And so the commercialization is eating up the entire space industry very, very fast. And for us, the only thing we needed to know was that it is possible. And then we just took on the challenge that, hey, this is really, really important for the entire humanity uh, that we use space sustainably. And also, um, so both on, a, on an ESG side, but as well on an active financial and time side. And this is what we want to enable with this area. It looks like we're going to see a much more uh, vibrant and competitive market across all parts of the space value chain. And uh, look, I'm really excited to see how ESAR uh, develops. Uh, looking forward to staying in touch with you. And uh, look, thanks for your time. A really fascinating interview. Thanks a lot for letting me share my thoughts. And uh, we're looking forward definitely to seeing what the industry has in store for all of us in the next years. Well, many of us, yours truly included, have dreamt about what it would be like to venture into space. Onyx Catalyst is an astronaut who got the opportunity to do just that. She's currently orbiting about 260 miles above Earth as part of a six-month mission to the International Space Station. She studied and trained four years to be able to withstand the rigors of space travel and watch her husband, fellow NASA astronaut Bob Bunken, do the same. Yes. Yet, nothing could prepare her for the sight of what she calls a blue marble earth, at once beautiful and fragile. In our final What If segment, Bloomberg New Economy Managing Editor Catherine Glass spoke to NASA astronaut Megan MacArthur from her temporary home at the International Space Station. Bloomberg New Economy, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Catherine Glass with Bloomberg New Economy. How do you hear me? Hello, Catherine. I have you loud and clear. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us, Megan. You're almost two months into your six-month mission at the International Space Station. How's it going? And... Um What's it like up there? Well, Catherine, it's going really, really well. Um, we just, our team had a very successful spacewalk yesterday. So everybody's still kind of enjoying that success, actually looking forward to the next uh, big spacewalk, which is coming up on Friday. And uh, every day brings a new set of challenges, uh, but uh, it's, it's a lot of fun every day and we're really enjoying it. What are some of the most important applications of the research that you're doing at the International Space Station and the technology, the space technology that you're using? What are some of the most important applications for, for that stuff on Earth? That's a great question. We are doing lots of different kinds of research aboard the International Space Station. We do medical research, we do technology demonstrations, and in both cases they do have applications not just for uh, spaceflight and for space exploration, but also for returns uh, for Earth. So one of the uh, technology demonstrators that we have on board Space Station right now is water reclamation. So we right now are reclaiming 93 percent of the water on the board the International Space Station and we have a new technology demonstrator that's hoping to, to bring that number up to 98 percent which is going to be really important for us for long duration space missions but as you can imagine the ability to have access to clean water of course is also very important on earth and so in some harsh and remote environments where people don't have ready access to clean water um, the space station technology has been adapted so that technology can be used the purification and filtration can be used to provide provide clean water, which is life-saving in some settings on Earth. Wow, that's really interesting. You know, uh, before you were an astronaut, or prior to being an astronaut, you were also an oceanographer. So speaking of water, what are some of the learnings, you know, the connections between the learnings that you've, um, you've had in space? How does that compare to what you've learned on missions in the ocean? I have always thought that there are similarities between ocean exploration and space exploration. Sometimes I get people that are confused and say, well, you were an oceanographer, how did you end up as an astronaut? But really, if you think about it, when you go out on a ship and you're doing research at sea, you have to be able to uh, you know, use what you have on board to complete your mission. So if something breaks, there's somebody on that ship that has to know how to fix it. You need all of the equipment you're going to need for the duration of your mission uh, to be with you, because um, uh, you're not just going into 
support every night. And so there's a lot of similarities uh, with the way we operate in space. Of course, we have a really extensive, really smart ground team that we can rely on to provide that extra level of support that we didn't have as much um, in oceanography. But uh, but we also, you know, when something breaks up here, we need to be able to fix it. We need to have a variety, all the varieties of equipment that we might need. And then and then you need to get creative to solve problems that you that you hadn't thought of before you left on your mission. What will define success for you on this mission and what more do you hope to learn um, in your next few months while at the International Space Station? So one of the really unique things I think about being a part of a mission like this, our, our expedition is going to be host to something like 200 different scientific investigations. And we have varying levels of interaction with those investigations. Some were very involved, where we're doing uh, something every day and we're hours, for example, in a glove box where we're um, pipetting different uh, cells and different treatments to, to work on an immunity um, study. And other things we have very simple um, interactions with where we're exchanging cartridges out of an experiment that largely runs on its own, for example. But over 200 science investigations, you can imagine, the results from those are going to be coming out over many years to come. And so getting to participate in so many of those experiments and then for the next several years, getting to hear about the, the discoveries and the successes, I think is really exciting. And so for me, success is going to be just kind of meeting the challenge every day of doing whatever those small tasks are that enable those discoveries in the long term. That's that's what I think success will look like for me. Do you feel like you've had any breakthroughs so far on some of those, those research experiments that you've been doing? Well, like I said, you know, so two months, it might sound like a really long time, but in, in terms of scientific discovery, sometimes, you know, the, the um, discoveries take a little bit longer. One thing I think that's really interesting that we have going on right now, um, that's a, a space-borne computer, too, that's been recently activated aboard the International Space Station. And the idea with that is to bring edge computing um, to the International Space Station. So right now, with all of the research projects that we have going on, we send a ton of data to the ground. And then once it reaches the ground, then the scientists have access to it, they can analyze it, they can get the information that they're looking for and um, you know, work on their research studies. But if we bring that more computing power here to the International Space Station, that processing can happen here and then they get their information rather than just raw data and that time to insight goes from, from months to maybe minutes. And so that I think is very exciting. That's going on right now and that's really going to help power our future missions where when we have you know, an outpost on the moon, we're going to be generating a ton of data, and that's really going to help us turn it around by bringing these modern computing um, technologies to the International Space Station and to our future uh, exploration missions. Wow. Um, back here on Earth, space tourism is kind of all the rage with billionaires like Jeff Bezos saying he's going to go into space. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, you're a seasoned astronaut, you know what to expect, but do you think it's a good idea to make space travel you know, more available to regular people? So I'm always saying, you know, when I'm talking to my family or with my friends, you know, I wish you could see this. It's so beautiful. Or I wish you could experience this. And that really is true. I think over the long term, I, I really think that it would be amazing for more people to get to experience what we get to experience up here in space. Um, but of course, there are risks. You have to accept those risks if you're going to do something like fly in space. And I think especially right now um, and in the foreseeable future, you have to have a certain amount of grit to deal with the challenges that exist, you know, the practicalities of, of living in space and, and to really get the joy out of it. You have to be willing to endure a little bit, I think. Speaking of conversations you have with your family, I know you have a son. Do you believe or do you guys have conversations about whether or not there is intelligent life on other planets? You know, he has not posed those kinds of questions uh, exactly. He is still, you know, kind of at that cusp of uh, are the cartoons that he sees real, um, you know, or the stories that he sees real. And so he's just starting to sort through all of that. Um, I absolutely would tell him I think that there is life elsewhere in the universe. Um, the universe is so mind-bogglingly vast that to me it's hard to believe that there isn't life somewhere else in the universe. And, um, we, you know, we have the James Webb Telescope launching soon, and one of the things that it will be able to do is 
potentially detect atmospheres that are similar to our own, which could be um, a beacon for us of, of life somewhere else in the universe. So that's very exciting. Um, we also are thinking about missions to Europa, one of Jupiter's moons that has oceans. And oceans are, of course, a, site, a, a source of very unique life on, on Earth and extreme uh, environments. And so that may also be a, a place for us to find signs of life. So lots of um, exciting things coming in the future. And I think lots of reasons to believe that, that there certainly is life somewhere in this uh, vast, vast universe that we're a part of. What's the most surprising thing you've discovered about yourself while on this mission? Uh, uh, you know, what's the biggest challenge that you face while you're in space? Um, so those are a couple of different questions. I don't know that I have surprised myself about myself necessarily. The challenges that we that we face are, you know, we have practical challenges, which are, you know, so yesterday, for example, my crewmates moving around a 750 pound solar array. How do you do that safely without losing control of it? Um, that's kind of a big practical uh, challenge. And a smaller one is, you know, how do you eat your dinner before it floats away from you? So a smaller practical challenges. And we have lots of those little challenges uh, all of the time. And you just you take you, you meet those challenges with different coping mechanisms. You're mindful about your movements. You're mindful about your environment. Um, we have, of course, the, the challenge of living in an isolated environment. We rely on each other as a crew. Uh, we use humor a lot to, to face the different challenges and frustrations that we have. So there's a lot of ways that, that we work together to meet those different challenges. Last question for you, Megan. You're orbiting 260 miles above Earth's surface. Does being that high up, does it change your perspective on Earth? We are so fortunate to live on this beautiful planet that we have, um, and, I, and I have always known that, you know, living on Earth, going to our beautiful national parks and, and visiting beautiful places around the world, but, but seeing the Earth from space, um, it is so beautiful, this blue marble that we have, um, but you also can see the fragility of it. You see how thin the atmosphere is relative to the, this vast blackness of space, and you feel, I think, very protective about the Earth and, and a very strong desire to, to protect protected um, because it's what is it's it's what is protecting us it is our spaceship through the universe and so it's it's definitely a responsibility that we have to protect our beautiful planet megan MacArthur, thank you for joining us enjoy the rest of your mission and get home safely to us thank you Catherine. And was that cool or was that cool? Mind-boggling, exciting. Now, this concludes our Bloomberg New Economy Catalyst program. We hope that our catalysts, like Megan MacArthur, have helped you to think in a new way about our vulnerable planet and the possibilities we have to make this blue marble shine more brightly. Before we close, a few words from our CEO, Justin Smith. Historically, pandemics change everything. COVID-19 is no exception. The Indian novelist Arundhati Roy described the virus as a portal. It is, she wrote, a gateway between one world and the next. Our extraordinary group of catalysts are shaping the new world that lies on the other side of this historic tragedy. They are the young visionaries who see beyond the problems that the pandemic has illuminated inequality, disease, climate change, and they show us the solutions. For some, the answers lie in space, for others, in the human genome or in green technology. Collectively, they inspire the rest of us to believe in a better future. Our catalysts will help drive the conversations in November at the New Economy Forum in Singapore, where global leaders will gather to address the biggest issues facing the world economy. We want you all to be a part of that conversation too. In this new world, everyone can and must be a catalyst for change. Thank you for joining us today and congratulations to all of our catalysts. We look forward to seeing you in person in November. Thank you, Justin. Wherever we look in the world of science and technology, new economy catalysts are there compressing change that we thought would stretch out over decades into months or even weeks. We look forward to welcoming them and you at the annual New Economy Forum here in the Lion City in Singapore, November 16th through 19th. Until then, thank you for joining us and be well.